Well, if you have enjoyed the first two episodes of this series talking about Oh, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Red Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai, you are in for a treat because we have two more, the Ark of the Covenant and Noah's Ark. Today we are going to be talking about the Ark of the Covenant with Kevin Fisher from Ark Discovery International, arcdiscovery.com. Welcome back, Kevin. Thank you. Nice to be here. We're happy to have you here. We have some artifacts on the table we want to get into right away. I'm sure most of our viewers are familiar with the, the Ark of the Covenant, if, if not uh, seeing it in Indiana Jones and sure. in other places. Yeah. but. Here is something very interesting I find. Uh, the design of the Ark, which we'll get into, th there is a first-hand account from Ron Wyatt. Yes. And this is his rendition printed out with a 3D printer. Yes. In the back we see the drawing that uh, he had Jim Pekoski do. He told Jim how to draw it. This is the, the image of the Ark of the Covenant. This is a 3D printing of it where the, the angels are attached to either end of the mercy seat and this lifts up. These are solid gold. So you have solid gold angels, solid gold mercy seat, and then this was acacia wood overlaid with gold, the box, and so the mercy seat you know, was very holy, and so it was made of solid gold, and these would lift up and be removed from the box or, or the ark itself. Mm. And of course the tables of stone would rest inside of there. Now another thing we want to point out before we get into any more detail is this tiny little pomegranate right here. Now this is an actual size that uh, something was found in the cave that we're going yes. to speak of in a moment on the way to find the ark. Yes, there's a tunnel that uh, eventually led to the ark I mean, Mr. White's excavations from 79 to 82. I believe this was found in 1979. It's a little ivory pomegranate that the Israeli Antiquities Authority, Mr. White, gave it to them of course, anything he would find during the dig, he would turn over to them. If it was not of any value, they would give it back to him. But they kept this. But shortly afterwards, the, the Israel Antiquities Authority, was some things were stolen out of it. Oh. And this was one of the items. And so it ended up in the hands of a French antiquities dealer. And so hmm. the Israel Antiquities Authority had to buy it back. And it's documented they spent 550000 buying this back because they knew it was real. Half a million bucks Yes, for that. Right. Now why is it so special? Because it's the only item from the first temple ever made public or ever found uh, made public. Really? So on the shoulder of it, it says, Holy to the Priests in the Temple of Yahweh. Hmm. So this was a priestly item. There's a hole drilled in the bottom of it where a little, round, little, little scepter would stick up into the bottom of it. Okay. So Ron did turn it over to them. It appears in the Biblical Archaeology Review ever so often. There was an article last year, 2016, about it. Um, there's no formal dig associated with it. So some of the people who don't know the insides, the inside information about the Ark of the Covenant, they're skeptical of it. You know, mm. where did this come from? How could this have appeared, you know, out of nowhere? Yeah. But, you know, Ron did operate under a permit, but only a few people knew about it. Mm. And it was found uh, in his early stages of the excavation. Now, another thing we have on this, on this table, which I'm sure people are wondering about, is this giant sword. Will you uh, hold that up for a second? Yes. Just look this, at the size of this thing. This was found inside the cave with the Ark of the Covenant. And we've got a slide later showing the verse in the Bible that states that uh, the sword was kept with the priest in the tabernacle, hmm. which is pretty unusual. And David went to the priest to borrow it, and he said, there's none like it. Huh. So it's a very unique uh, sword. It's very large. That's the first thing you see is it's very long. It's 62 inches long, 5 feet 2 inches. That's the first thing. The next thing you see are these rounded hand guards. This, so this is, is a very accurate replica then. Yes, yeah. this is the shape of Goliath's sword. Okay. Found in the cave with the Ark of the Covenant. Goliath's sword. Goliath's sword. Ah, okay. Yes. So it was kept with the temple furnishings. Hmm. You know, we're told in 1 Samuel. So, um, well, this is all very, very yes. interesting. Let's get into this. Well, where all this yes. was found. Yes. Yeah, so we'll, right. we'll get into this a little bit later too when we see the slide on the, the verse talking about that. But. Okay. So you have a, a slide presentation to show us of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, yes. first of all, uh, if it's not in your presentation somewhere, I don't want to steal your thunder, but uh, where is this located? The Before Ark, we get into that. The Ark of the Covenant? 
it's, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, it's it's uh, north of the old city walls, mm -hmm. and it's in the Garden Tomb grounds. Hmm. It's located in that area, underground in a cave, and that's where Mr. Wyatt found it. It's still there today. Interesting. Okay. Yes. All right, well, so, without further ado, go ahead. Tell us about sure. the Ark of the Covenant and how you found it. Yes, and so our first slide here is myself with Ron Wyatt in 1997. Um, as we were saying, Mr. Wyatt is the discoverer of the Ark of the Covenant. He also found the Noah's Ark site, the Sodom and Gomorrah sites, the Red Sea Crossing, the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. Mm. And so his credibility has been established. And when he comes out with this report, of finding the Ark of the Covenant, we should believe him because, you know, on the Day of Atonement in historical times, when the high priest would go into the most holy place to anoint the most holy or the Ark of the Covenant, only one person would go in. And it wasn't a committee going in. It was one person and Mr. White was chosen by God to be able to go into that cave. He mm. came out with a report and it's very exciting information. And we talked about the, the death of those folks who tried to follow in and do something, uh, you know, uh, noble with it, but they, they died going in. And we, we talked about that on the first episode of the series. Yes. Yes, God, you know, is, is protecting the ark. In 1995, there were six men sent up this tunnel to try to get to the Ark of the Covenant, and they were all struck dead. Mm. And Mr. White was asked to pull their bodies out. I'm assuming because everyone else was afraid to uh, <laughs> do anything, and he made right. it in and out alive. Yes. <laughs> so uh, wow. the Israelis know that it's real, that it's there, but they don't know what to do. Goodness. Okay, so what are we seeing here? So this is the entrance to the Garden Tomb Grounds. Uh, this is a very significant area. This is the Protestant location, you could say, of Jesus' burial site. And inside is the tomb of Christ. His feet would have been placed to the right, and then his head to the left. They had to carve out the feet area because he was apparently taller than Joseph of Arimathea. Oh, interesting. Uh, this is like six feet four inches in length right here. And then this is where you exit the tomb. This is the exact place where Jesus walked. It's, it's mm. a tremendous opportunity to be able to walk out of this cave this is a, or this uh, wow. tomb. You can actually walk out where Jesus walked out triumphantly. This is the best place to go on earth. It's incredible. And this is uh, unlike a lot of other archaeological sites that are made up or supposed or assumed. There's enough evidence to suggest that this is the real one. Yes. The uh, ceiling stone or rolling stone, we're told in the Bible, was a great stone. And it was found over at the site we'll see shortly was the crucifixion site. Mm. It was moved over there and incorporated with the crucifixion area. So the local Christians knew this was the crucifixion site and the tomb of Christ. So here in front of the tomb, we see a cutout area where early Christians would have done foot washings, oh, service okay. of humility. And so this is an image of Mr. Wyatt. He was the one who found the crucifixion area we're going to see, found the Ark of the Covenant. And if you head back to the further areas of the garden, away from the actual tomb, you'll come to an area where Mr. Wyatt was walking with a gentleman head of the Jerusalem Antiquities Authority for the Jerusalem area in 1978, and Ron's arm was lifted up, hmm. and God put these words in his mouth, there's Jeremiah's grotto, and the Ark of the Covenant is in there, and this is a spot Mr. Wyatt pointed to, ah. a trash heap next to this rock escarpment. Wow. And he was puzzled. Why did I say, you know, those words? But uh, the Israeli authority official said that they would provide him a place to stay. They would give him a permit, provide his food. And so in 1979, the next year, he started the excavation for the Ark of the Covenant. Hmm. And these are the words, there's Jeremiah's grotto, and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. So this is an image of Mr. Wyatt digging the excavation, started in 79, and in 1982 is when he actually found the cave. Now here's some of the group they are helping him with the excavation. A lot of people volunteered for the dig for the Ark. He'd actually dug two tunnels, mm. uh, the first tunnel, he made it into the cave in 1982, January 6, and then around 1989, 1990, he finished the second tunnel. 
So digging two tunnels, if you're fraud, all you need is one tunnel. <laughs> but he felt like some of the temple furnishings needed to come out. Ah. And he dug a second tunnel that was more direct, a better tunnel getting to the Ark Cave. Okay. Spent a lot of money on that. And so... Big enough to, to drag out <coughs> some of the items. Yes. Which he never did, incidentally. Right. He understood later that things were not coming out. Is that, was that just for uh, reasons of keeping things holy and leave it alone? Or, or what, what was the reason he didn't bring it up? Well, originally the things, uh, there were a lot of stones packed in, in this cave with the temple furnishings. And in his fourth visit uh, that we'll see in a video here, that everything was cleaned out and everything was placed in order, mm. in orderly fashion. The angels or God arranged everything neatly. And so he felt like, hey, this is a permanent arrangement. Mm. And that things would not be coming out. He so, dare not touch it. Yes. Okay. Right. Gotcha. So here's an image of Mr. Wyatt in one of the tunnels, squeezing through. There are chimneys going up and chimneys going down and sliding across a board, a 40 foot chasm below. Oh, goodness. And so the first tunnel, very precarious, 100 feet in length. But uh, Did he dig all of these or did he find tunnels, uh, dig a little bit and find a tunnel and followed it? What, what there were the some process? naturally carved out of the limestone mm. that could allow you to go a little further and you know, created some additional routes for him to, to go down and, and he didn't know exactly where underground to look. It was just a matter of exploring and, and digging through the rock huh. and so forth. But during the excavation he found these cutouts in the rock, the cutouts in the rock face. This is where the signs were placed, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, mm. at Jesus' crucifixion. And this may have also been placed on the cross itself. But these were large public signs for people traveling through the area to see what was going on here, who was being crucified. Right, because the Romans were very public about that. They wanted yes. to put their crucifixions on a main road so that no one would dare mess with the Romans. Intimidation, yes, yeah. that's part of their plan. This is another image of the cutouts. Mr. White here with one of his sons who helped with the early excavation. And I guess the cutouts were, and with the signs, were like a, an ancient billboard. Yes. That this is what this person did. Right. And let it be known that you'll yes. be humiliated if you do the same. The name and what they're guilty of, mm. you know. So, uh, and during the excavation, this is Mr. White's photo, he was able to locate the cross hole. Mm. This is the cross hole this of Christ. Is, so this is a center. Now he found, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard this where he, he found three. And he, this is the center one. Yes, this is the center one. And it's in the bedrock. But uh, there have been some other photos kind of passed around previously, but this is the correct one here. Uh, this is an image taken by Mr. Wyatt. Now is there a crack that we see there in the bottom? Is that what that is? That's actually the handle of a crowbar. Oh, okay. In the, the bottom area there. But uh, so when he first found the cutouts and the cross hole, and then later he made it into the cave and found here the cave was in a stone box. And there were a lot of stones packed in there on top of the temple furnishings. Underneath the stones were animal skins and, mm. bo and boards that they were, they were protecting the temple furnishings. So Mr. Wyatt crawled in there and saw the sarcophagus. It's like a stone box holding the Ark of the Covenant. And inside, this is an image of it again, inside the box was the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Did he try to uh, photograph it? Did he? At that moment, he could not get into it, but his next trip in there, he drilled a hole in the side of the stone box and put in a little camera. He could see uh, the Ark of the Covenant inside of there mm. with that. So, yeah. And then inside the cave, he saw the original entrance by Jeremiah's men. Jeremiah's mm. men hid the Ark of the Covenant in this cave when the Babylonian army had surrounded Jerusalem in 586 B.C. They didn't want, of course, the Ark to be destroyed by the Babylonians or taken away, so God had it uh, hidden in this chamber. And this is the entrance here that Jeremiah's men used to bring the ark in here. And uh, Michael uh, uh, pay, pays attention to this as well with the, the se great secret of Solomon's temple, which is how the Ark of the Covenant was taken out of the temple and then whisked away 
to this location uh, very secretly. You can yes. look at that too. Yes. So yes, it was taken down into Zedekiah's cave and then brought up a tunnel underground to this current location, a cave uh, about 40 feet underground. Now, when Christ died and the earth shook and the rocks were rent, a crack came right down the entire face of the escarpment, right past the left side of the cross hole, and the stone opened up. Down below, 20 feet below, God had arranged for the Ark of the Covenant with its mercy seat, if you please, his earthly throne, to be positioned right down there 600 years before in 586 B.C. <coughs> when the Babylonian army destroyed the city. When the centurion stuck his spear in Christ's spleen and probably left ventricle to make sure he was dead before he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea, when he pulled that spear out, the separated platelets and serum of the blood of the Son of God gushed out, went down through that crack onto the mercy seat, and that ratified the old covenant and the new covenant. That is amazing. So how exactly did this happen? So we've got some animation here showing how this happened. Uh, we see Christ on the cross. We see the two thieves in front of him. We see the cutouts in the rock in back, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and there was a great earthquake. The earthquake opened up the rock below the cross hole. The rock extended down into the cave below and the stone lid of the box was broken and moved askew. Christ was pierced in his side. The blood came out, ran down this crack, and fell onto the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Quite amazing stuff. That is. Now, he, now that, this, is, this is 18 feet down, something. There's 18 feet of bedrock? It's 20 feet of bedrock, yes. Feet of bedrock. Now, that's plausible because when they, when they put, pr thrust the... Uh, the sword into his side, there was a lot of liquid that came out there. Yes. So it is plausible that it would travel 20 feet down. Yes. They separated red blood cells, white blood cells, the, the water and the blood mm -hmm. came out of his side and fell down and anointed the Most Holy. And um, that left side of the Ark of the Covenant, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it was kept open. It was not ever anointed by the blood of bulls and goats in the past. It was kept vacant for this application. You know, I've seen pictures of how that happened, but seeing it in animation really helps to understand exactly what happened there. It brings it to life, doesn't yeah. it? Yes. So the blood fell on this left side, the western side of the Ark of the Covenant. Now we're told in Leviticus 16, and he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. Before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. So when the priests went in there on the Day of Atonement, always they sprinkled it toward the east or would be the right side of the Ark of the Covenant, leaving a vacant left side or western side of the Ark of the Covenant. I'm sure the, the high priest knew that that left side, the western side, was being kept vacant for the application of the Messiah to one day give his blood. And so on the mercy seat, you have the blood of Jesus on the left or western side hmm. and the blood of bulls and, and goats on the right side, both of them a testimony. Now we're told in Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So this most holy place is where the Ark of the Covenant rested. It was called the most holy place because it was the most holy. And we're told here that it would atone for iniquity. What happened on the day of atonement? Blood was placed on the most holy. So I believe here in Daniel 9, 24, this is prophesying that within this time period of the 70 weeks hmm. that uh, the Messiah would anoint the most holy, and that's what happened. And then we're also told in Leviticus 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. 
Where is the blood that make atonement for the soul? So Jesus' life was represented by that blood. His sinless life was placed on the altar and was making atonement for us. Not a life of a sinner, but a life of a sinless person atoned for our sins. So it's very significant. So uh, the Israel Antiquities Authority, they actually recognize that Ron found chambers at the site. On their website, they say the excavation was conducted south of a natural bedrock outcrop that was identified by General Gordon in 1883 as Golgotha. During the 1980s, Ron White excavated several underground chambers at the site. They're acknowledging that he was there. Now, how many people know this? I didn't yes. know that this was on the IAA website. Yes. So this is, you know, they're actually acknowledging, yes, he found chambers here. Wow. And this is still on there? Well, it was or years ago. Knowledge. I don't know if yeah. it is at this moment, but this is what I found on their website. Wow. Ron White conducted an excavation in the 1980s, which revealed a number of subterranean cavities. So they are acknowledging hmm. that he found things there. So today in the gift shop there at the Garden Tomb Grounds, they have a book. Here it is sitting there on the shelf. It's General Gordon's uh, notes on Golgotha. And inside his book, and he's recognized as finding Golgotha. He's associated with the Garden Tomb, with the, the Golgotha, the place of the skull. And in his book, he says, the ark, I suspect, is in Jeremiah's grotto. Jews have a tradition, it is under the Dumb of the Rock, but I think it's under the true altar, the skull, where tradition places Jeremiah's writing of lamentations. Hmm. So, and then he says, here at Skull Hill, close to the slaughterhouse of Jeremiah, was uh, Titus 1 to 2. The Roman eagle took the heart of Zion by the throat, for close was the breach. Jeremiah wrote Lamentations in the cave. The Ark of the Covenant is in there. So he is highly revered, General Gordon, and he is acknowledging that the Ark is hidden in that area. Hmm. And when Ron White was conducting his excavations, he found evidence that General Gordon had been excavating within 10 feet. Really? Where he had been excavating. So quite interesting. And in this video clip here, we have Jerusalem at night, where you can see the Temple Mount. So this is a video you have here of, uh, of the, uh, the Temple Mount. This is a Temple Mount taken at night from the Mount of Olives. This is where the Temple Mount is where a lot of people say the Ark of the Covenant was hidden uh, under the Dome of the Rock, that area there. But uh, no evidence has been found of such. This is the Western Wall. I believe that the Temple was placed up above this originally and that the ark could be hidden back in here. But once again, there's, there's no evidence of that. Um, Mr. Wyatt, you know, has claims he found it in the Garden Tomb grounds. But uh, this is considered a holy site to the Jews because it's at the base of where the tabernacle was, the second temple, first temple. Here we can see the Jews at the western wall. But the ark is not there. It's not. The ark was, however, found here in this next slide. It was it was secreted or, or through this uh, transported through yeah, there. I should through say through Zedekiah's cave. This is a cave underneath Jerusalem today. You can pay four bucks, go in here. It's owned by the East Jerusalem Development Company, and the Palestinians own it. Uh, you can go inside of there, and here is the signs: uh, King Solomon's quarries. The rock was quarried for the temple out of this cave here. They created the cave basically by coring out the rock. But the ark would have been dropped down from street level up above down into this quarry in 586 BC. Here we are walking down the steps into uh, Zedekiah's cave. But uh, you can see straight angles here where the blocks were quarried out, 90 degree angles and so forth. Here you can see more 90 degree angles obviously hewn with human hands. Yes, where they were coring out the rocks. But the ark was dropped down through here, and there's a sign here indicating that there was a carving at this point, a carved figure. It was found in 1874, and it's now in a museum in London. But uh, this is where it was cut out of the rock, this carving. And what this is, is a four-legged creature with wings and a type of human head on it. 
and it was used to mark the way where the Ark of the Covenant was taken. Oh, goodness. Well, let us let me stop you there. We'll have a cliffhanger yes. here. We're going to come right back with more of the Ark of the Covenant. For more than 20 years, Ron Wyatt spent his life and his life savings on researching and finding the real Mount Sinai, Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah's Ark, and the Ark of the Covenant. Discover the amazing truth of Ron Wyatt's discoveries in a special series from A Rude Awakening International, A.D., Archaeology Discovered. Special guest Kevin Fisher walks you through every discovery in detail, including his personal verification that the sites Ron White found are real. The, you can see the four major discoveries, the Noah's Ark, Red Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai, Solomon, Gomorrah, those are visible things. Right now, you can order this fascinating series on DVD and Blu-ray. You'll get all four episodes as seen on Shabbat Night Live. It's not for us. God has a timing for this. It's not for us to force the issue, you know, to try to bring it out. So, Israeli authority, they know it's there. Order AD, Archaeology Discovered. Order online or by phone. And welcome back. Thank you for your support of Shabbat Night Live. Now, in the first section of the program, we talked about uh, several very interesting things. We left you with a cliffhanger about where the Ark of the Covenant was found. It has to do with a carving on the side of a cave. Kevin Fisher, tell us more. Yes, so we saw the carving there. And in 2 Maccabees 2, now the Apocrypha may not be totally 100% inspired, but it does have some nice historical information in it. It says here, Jeremiah found a cave dwelling. He carried the tent, the ark, the incense altar into it, then blocked up the entrance. Some of his companions came to mark out the way, hmm. but were unable to find it. When Jeremiah learned of this, he reprimanded them. The place shall remain unknown, he said, until God finally gathers his people together and shows mercy to them. Then the Lord will bring these things to light again. So Jeremiah's men were marking the way when they were taking the Ark of the Covenant. And not far from here is a tunnel that leads all the way up to mm. its current location. But uh, So they were told, you've you stop carving. Yes. And they, they just about gave away the, the surprise. Right, right. Okay. So just about um, 50, 60 feet from here is this large man-made wall that was thrown up hastily. Behind this wall is a tunnel that leads up 370 feet to where the Ark of the Covenant is today. Wow. So if one were allowed by proper authorities to take down this wall, it, a, a, a straight tunnel right to the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. Wow. So here we are standing next to the wall. Um, again, it's probably 40 to 50 feet across, closing up a tunnel through there. And in our video here, so we're panning across the wall. This is pitch black, but we did bring in a few lights. And you can see that this is a man-made straight wall going across. It does look like it was made in a hurry. Yes, it? and in Ron's later years, he would come to this wall and he would stand there, and if God wanted him to proceed, a man or an angel would come up to him and say, remove these stones and you can proceed. So, but in the early years, he didn't have that luxury. Mm. He had to do the years and years of digging to get to the ark cave and so forth. So, where the ark is, it's in a garden in John 19. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Mm. So the area where the crucifixion site is, there should be a garden and a new tomb. And that's what we have at the garden tomb grounds you today. Know, I've read that verse a thousand times, and you don't correlate that these things, according to that verse, if you take it literally, yes. should be right they next door. They should be door. together, yeah. And so there in the garden tomb grounds, you have evidence that this was a garden area. Here is an ancient wine press, very large, one of the largest uh, in Jerusalem. And there's the tomb itself. Mm. And in Matthew 27, make it secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So just to the left of the entrance to the tomb, I had my hand next to this iron rod. Why is the iron, iron rod there? They were sealing the rolling stone so it could not roll back 
to the left here. Here's a close-up of it where the iron rod was broken off by the angel. When the angel came down, he broke off that iron rod that was sealing the stone, keeping it from rolling back and allowing the stone, stone to be rolled back to the left. And of course, Jesus came out triumphant. And as I understand, there's proof of that because the Romans had an iron pin uh, sealed in molten lead. Yes. That's the way they sealed things. That's what's found in the Colosseum. Yes. And so this was that same construction method. That's right. That's what they found there. So, and also John 19, he bearing his cross went out to a place called Place of the Skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him. And so if you go to the far end of the garden tomb grounds, you can look out over the overlook there and you see a short distance away, maybe 40 yards, is this place of the skull. Hmm. So you can see the two eye sockets here, the nose. And so again, this is showing us that we're in the correct location. Now this is the cutouts. I'm standing here next to the cutouts. Um, this is near current ground level today. It's, ground level is a little bit higher than this, about three feet. But uh, those are the cutouts, and the Ark of the Covenant would be approximately below where I'm standing there. Wow. This is the way it looks today, as far as there's a deck that's been built there. <laughs> a nice place to have lunch right on top oh, yeah. of the Ark of the Covenant. Right, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that table is close to where the Ark of the Covenant is um, underground, about 40, 45 feet under this. So right around this is where that, that center cross hole was yeah, found the as well. Yeah, cross hole would be underground below this, yes, okay. in the bedrock. So once again, here's another angle showing the cutouts to our left here where the signs were placed, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And then there's a walkway headed over to the right mm. toward Golgotha, the place of the skull. And we're told in Matthew 27, the rocks were rent, so there was a major earthquake that split the rock and would have allowed the blood to go down into the cave. And in this rock escarpment, you can see large cracks in it mm. where an earthquake took place at some point. Yeah, something definitely happened there, isn't it? Yes. And there's an image again of the cross hole that's down below, below and, and in front of where those cutouts were that we saw earlier. This would be the cross hole. So this hole. below that, that uh, modern deck. Yes, it's below the below deck, there. yeah, about 40. About, will it be about maybe approximately uh, 25 feet below that. Is that still uh, exposed or, or how, how would someone? All, it's all covered up. It's all you covered know, up the now? The cross hole, yes. Okay. Yes, it's below 20 to 25 feet of, of, of earth at this point. Mm. But this was the cross hole plug. When the cross hole was not being used, the stone was placed in the hole mm. so it would not fill up with debris so people wouldn't fall in it or whatever. That's so, a large hole. Yes. It's approximately 12 inches by 13 inches. Wow. Yes. And so here it is again. This is probably the bottom side of it where um, it was turned over. And to the right, we see a deck timber from Noah's Ark while we're on the slide. Huh. But uh, that's, so <laughs> That's coming next episode. <laughs> yes. Those are two interesting <laughs> items there. So there is a cross hole plug. And also in the cave were found seven oil lamps hmm. in the Ark of the Covenant cave. Six were turned over to Israel Antiquities Authority, and Ron kept one of them. It's interesting, this lamp here shows a ram in a thicket. Ah, yes it does. Now, I, I saw that picture earlier and I wondered what that, that do goat recall, was doing. We call a story relating to Abraham where there was a ram in a thicket mm -hmm. in Isaac. This is the same hill, Mount Moriah, where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac. But God said, no, I will provide a sacrifice. He provided the ram that day, but then 2,000 years later, he provided his own son for us. So same location where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac, God had to sacrifice his own son. I've heard some people say, that's terrible, God wanted Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. That is so terrible. But God had to do it to his own son. Very heartbreaking. And know, this is a, that's an incredible 
uh, by o only by the power of Yehovah, by God. Would this yes. be possible that an yes. oil lamp is a marker of that site? Right, right. That's unreal. So, and we're told in 1 Samuel now, David went to the priest to borrow it. And it's the sword we're talking about here. Mm, okay. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other save it here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. And so here we have the, this is the shape of Goliath's sword. Once again, we saw the length of it is very long. It's mm -hmm. 62 inches in length. It's still in the cave there with the Ark of the Covenant. Now it's got this hand guard with these curved ends. What these are designed to do is if a sword comes down here, it can get caught, caught in ah. here, okay? It gets caught inside of there. And that allows Goliath just to, he can just kick the person down. They're so small. I mean, this allows him to, to move through people. And then another interesting thing is, is you notice these points here mm -hmm. on either side. So there's two side points, and then you have the major point. So these side points were designed to rip and tear. As he's slicing across somebody, this will rip and tear their, their mail. Uh, the chain mail that they're carrying, mm -hmm. or whatever type of armor, and this is designed to slash and tear through somebody. Hmm. So this is a real That's weapon. Very here. innovative. Yes, and it would have been very heavy, of course. Um, no problem for him to carry, but um, so it's mentioned as being in there with the priest in the tabernacle, and that's where it was found by Ron Wyatt there hmm. in the cave with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I guess all the proof anyone will need is when that that area is finally opened to the public and everything is seen there many years after Ron has passed and it's exactly as he said it was, yes. he'll finally be... Yes, we'll see this at, at some point. Yeah. So now we've got a video. The fourth trip I made into this chamber, it was spotless. The furnishings were set in perfect order. The Ark of the Covenant, however, had been placed against the wall, the end of the cave. The end of the cave was a beautiful crystal radiating the colors of the rainbow. Now, I know New Age and all that goes in for rainbows, so do homosexuals and all of that. But God used it first, all right? It's around his throne, and it's around his earthly throne. Now, there's no veil in this setup, so it is the earthly, it's God's temple on earth, or his residence where he once dwelt, and uh, anyway, when I found it like this, there were four young men standing in there, and I started to say, you know, what are you doing here? And I froze. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything. One of the people said, we are the four angels that have been taking care of the ark since Moses put the tables of stone in it, right? And they instructed me to set up my video camera with the tripod, aim it at the Ark of the Covenant, and they went over, lifted the mercy seat up. I don't know how heavy it is. I've never tried to lift it, but it's solid gold. And the angel said, take the tables of stone out of there. God wants everyone to see those. I took them out, all right? They put the mercy seat back down over the Ark of the Covenant. I backed away a little bit. The angel came, got the tables of stone, put them on a rock ledge inside the chamber. And I was then instructed to take a sample of the blood from the mercy seat, have that analyzed. And I did everything the angel told me to do. Real quickly, okay, uh, dried blood is dead blood. Everybody knows that, all right? They can test the blood of the pharaohs, the mummies of the pharaohs, all right? There's certain things they can do. They cannot get a chromosome count by any method I'm familiar with, all right? Things keep changing. I don't profess to know everything. 
However, there's no way I know that you can get a chromosome count out of dead blood. You can get a DNA and some other things, but not a chromosome count, all right? That's done by living white blood cells. Now then, first of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling. All right? That's their business. That's great. I said, now, I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. So I was back. They checked it out. I said, now, uh, they said, it's human blood. We can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium and keep them at body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under microscope, and the one technician called the other one over there, and then they called the boss over there, and they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit, and they looked at me and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. Everybody else has 46. You see, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father, all right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch a child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from a source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. And I assure you, those men's lives have changed. That is amazing. You know, I've heard this from Jim and Penny Caldwell as well. They've picked up on this as well, this, this research of how the, the blood is, is not human. That it, well, it's human, but it's not like every other human. It's unique, yes. Right, it's unique. Yes. So, as Ron is saying, a normal person has 46 chromosomes, as we see in this graphic. You have 22 autosomes from each parent, and then the female donates the X sex determinant chromosome, the male determines the X or Y, depending if it's a male or female. So 46 chromosomes is in a normal arrangement. But with this blood, it's totally unique. As we see here, there's 22 autosomes, and then the X from the mother, but then there's only a Y sex determinant chromosome given by God, but there's no 22 autosomes hmm. from God. So this is showing us he had no earthly father. Wow. He just had a heavenly father who gave the Y chromosome. And so this is evidence that's gonna be shown to planet Earth in the last days. They're going to see this, and it's, it's quite amazing. And Ron, when they did the test in the lab, um, the Israelis, they went hysterical. They were screaming and pulling at their hair that they saw the blood of their Messiah 
in front of them. Really? So this, this test was done then in Israel? The, yes. The, the lab was in Israel? Yes. Now, what did they do? I mean, what did they do with this afterwards? Where are the results? Well, the results are in the cave with the Ark of the Covenant, as far as I know. At least uh, I know a video may have been shot of it. And if there's a printed test result, it may be there also. But Ron took the videotape of his encounter in the cave with the angels. He took that back and set them there with the Ten Commandments. And then this video of the testing on the blood is probably there. And if there's a print report, it's probably there. Hmm. So he kept, kept it there for safekeeping because he knew that when the mark of the beast law is enforced, as the angel said, then the Ten Commandments will come out of the cave. Hmm. So God has everything uh, planned for a final show and tell for <laughs> planet Earth. But we're told in, in 1 Timothy, it says, for there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. This is a future event, a testimony of Jesus. And I believe that's what the blood is. Mm. It's the testimony of who Jesus was. He really was the Messiah. Now you and I, we may not need this information. You know, we're Christians, you know, we're set, ready to go. But the majority of the world, they have grown up in false belief systems, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists, even the Jews, they need this. So God is going to provide evidence of who his son was before he judges mankind. He's going to show them Jesus really was the Messiah. Now you need to ask you know, forgiveness of your sins in Jesus' name, accept him, and by giving your heart to God, then he will allow the Holy Spirit in us and he will work through us and enable us to keep the Ten Commandments. That's why the Ten Commandments are coming out is because there's going to be a future law against the Ten Commandments, okay? And the Ten Commandments from God are going to come out as a testimony against the man-made law. So God has a plan on how he's going to reveal this to planet Earth. Now with 1 John 5, 6 to 9, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and by blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. So this is speaking of the blood and the water being a witness. And they agree as one. And it's, it's in the earth. And so we believe, Ron Wyatt believed, that this is referring to the blood that's going to come out, the testimony of the blood to plant, planet, planet Earth, 1 John 5, 6 to 9. Very infor, important text here. And in Psalm 77, 13, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Again, this is like the way of salvation, God's way, redemption of man, is through the sanctuary. And the blood being on that mercy seat there on the left side or western side of the Ark of the Covenant, that's the redemption of mankind, evidence there hmm. that mankind was redeemed. And in Psalm 85, 11, truth shall spring out of the earth. And we're seeing that today. Truth is coming out, whether it be Noah's Ark or the Red Sea Crossing or Mount Sinai or Sodom and Gomorrah, but ultimately the blood of Jesus being shown coming out of the earth. Everyone on earth will see this during the Mark of the Beast showdown. The evidence of Jesus being the real Messiah, hmm. and evidence of the Ten Commandments, and the lab test of Jesus' blood being unique. These are three things that are going to come out. The Ark of the Covenant was a holding place of evidence. You know, the golden pot of manna had been placed in there previously. Aaron's rod that budded was placed in there as a testimony. The pot of manna was a testimony of God's provision for his people. Aaron's rod that budded was showing that the tribe of Levi, they were to be the priests in the tabernacle. The Ten Commandments, the ark sometimes was called the ark of his testimony for the Ten Commandments. And then you had the blood of bulls and goats 
on the east side of the mercy seat. That's another testimony hmm. of the old covenant, of the old sacrifices. And then on the western side of the mercy seat, you had the blood of Jesus. So this is a holding place of evidence, the Ark of the Covenant, and that's what's going to be shown to planet Earth. And something unique here. I believe in this text, Ron Wyatt did also believe, Revelation 11:19. Let's take a look at this. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there were seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now, wait a minute. Some people say this is in the third heaven where the new Jerusalem is, but are there lightnings, thunderings, and earthquake or great hail? Hmm in the New Jerusalem, I say no. This sounds like the final plagues. Let's take a look up here also where it says opened in heaven. If you take a look at that Greek word Uranus, the first definition is sky. This is a first heaven event or the atmosphere of this earth. And so let's take another look at this. And the temple, now the most important temple would be where the Ark of the Covenant is today. The cave temple. So let's take another look. And the cave temple of God was opened in heaven, or in this case, the sky of planet Earth. And there were seen in his cave temple the ark of his testimony, or testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. This is an hmm. end time event near the time of the plagues. Planet Earth is going to see the ark of his testament. This is a worldwide atmospheric around the entire world, the first heaven, mm. everyone's going to see this, a worldwide event. So I believe Revelation 11:19 is speaking of this going to take place soon. Fascinating. That is amazing. Thank you for bringing this out today. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you for coming Thank today, you. Kevin. Appreciate it. Now, we have one more episode to come. Noah's Ark is going to be coming up in our next episode. Until then, until we see you next time, thank you for supporting this program. If you'd like more information on Kevin's ministry, go to arkdiscovery.com. If you'd like to see more on the Ark of the Covenant, uh, you can go to our website, arudawakening.tv, and check out Michael's uh, teachings on that as well. Until next time, we'll see you. Shalom. And we'll be talking about the Noah's Ark up next. <laughs>